One has teeth like steak knives, claws of steel, and is six tons of pure terror? T-Rex, the ultimate killing dinosaur. This team of diggers has found more T-Rexes than any other. As they probe inside its skull, they find what's on its mind. Dinosaur hunters in Argentina have discovered a killer that's even bigger than T-Rex. But was it as ferocious? A bone bed in Wyoming reveals a tender side to the grizzly allosaurs. They may have had family values. A dinosaur digging family has unearthed the baby they call Bambi. But watch out, this baby bites. It's a raptor. The awful allosaurs, the nastiest raptors, the most cunning carnivores. Meet the dinosaur's killer elite. In the desolate badlands of South Dakota, a team of diggers searches for something nearly as precious as diamonds. The bones of Tyrannosaurus rex. Everyone's heard of T-Rex, but almost nobody has found one. Despite a century of searching, no more than two dozen specimens have ever turned up. But this team has found more T-Rexes than anyone else. They're from the Black Hills Institute, a private fossil hunting operation headquartered in Hill City, South Dakota. Since 1990, they've uncovered five T-Rexes, including two of the most complete and largest skeletons anyone has ever seen. Three years ago, they found the first fragments of a T-Rex they nicknamed Duffy. This year, they're back to recover the rest of this once mighty meat eater. Tyrannosaurs were armed with slashing claws and jaws bristling with six-inch serrated teeth. They belonged to a group of meat-eating dinosaurs called theropods, meaning beast foot. Common features were a two-legged stance and three main toes on their hind feet. Some were as small as chickens, but an adult T-Rex weighed in at six tons, a bit more than a modern bull elephant. They lived near the end of the dinosaur era, the late Cretaceous, from 80 to 65 million years ago. On T-Rex's trail is a team led by dinosaur hunter and Black Hills president, Neil Larson, now a veteran of five T-Rex digs. Finding Duffy's bones is proving difficult. After three seasons, only 25% of the skeleton has been unearthed. Many of the large leg and backbones are still missing. So is much of the head. This year, Larson hopes their luck will change. Well, there's a number of skull bones that we have not yet found for Duffy. We don't know if we found the brain case or the very front part of the, of the nose of the Tyrannosaurus rex. Those would be extremely important to find because it would finish giving Duffy a face. Dinosaur skeletons are rarely found with the bones lying in their proper places next to each other. 
More often, scavengers would drag off pieces of the decomposing dinosaur, scattering them over the landscape. That's what dinosaur hunter Terry Wentz suspects happened here. Duffy was scavenged upon and scattered through a large area with a kind of a pocket of bones down here by where these folks are working. And then we found scattered skull bones way off in the distance. Now what we'd like to find is maybe where the animal actually died because most of those bones are the lighter bones. We'd like to find the heavy pelvic bones and the leg bones. With no way of telling where the rest of Duffy lies or even if it still exists, Wentz's crew starts by scraping away layers of topsoil. They watch carefully for any sign of fossils. A trained eye can tell fossils apart from rock by their distinctive color and texture. If the crew spots one, they'll start digging by hand. It's demanding work. Soon the team uncovers an exciting fossil, but not a dinosaur. They found the remains of a giant sequoia tree. It testifies to how drastically the parched badlands have changed since T-Rex's day, when they were covered by a lush forest. Deep in this forest, 68 million years ago, a tyrannosaur died. Scavengers moved in, ripping away its rotting flesh and scattering its bones. Eventually, the earth covered them up, locking them underground for millions of years. Today, rain, snow, and wind have eroded the ground, and the bones lie just beneath the surface, waiting for the Black Hills crew to uncover them again. Eventually, the team spots a tooth, and then they discover the very fragment they were hoping to find, the bone from Duffy's front jaw. This is an important bone because this is the part that held the first four, four teeth of the face of Tyrannosaurus rex. It also held the opening for the nostril of the Tyrannosaurus rex. But another reason it's so important is because this bone holds the first four teeth of the T-Rex that would bite into its prey. This is the front of the skull tooth. What's really neat about this tooth is that the tooth broke off in life and then it kept using it even after it chipped it and it even polished the, the face of it. It probably broke its tooth biting another Tyrannosaurus rex or biting into the bone of another dinosaur. Digging up Duffy's bones is just the first step. Now they must be taken back to the Black Hills lab, where they'll be cleaned and studied. Everyone in Hill City, South Dakota, knows how to find Black Hills Institute. Locate the sign with a burger-eating dinosaur and look across the street. You'll see a tyrannosaur skull guarding the entrance. Most of the time, Hill City is a quiet town, but in 1992, it became the center of one of the hottest dinosaur disputes of all time. On May 14th, a dozen FBI agents, the National Guard, and local police carried out a surprise raid. They'd come to seize Black Hill's most valuable discovery, the largest and most complete T-Rex ever found, nicknamed Sue. The government claimed that Pete Larson, Neil's brother, dug up Sue in 1990 from public land without permission. They confiscated the bones and locked them up at the South Dakota School of Mines. Larson denied the charge. Hill City residents were up in arms about the government's actions and protested. It didn't help. Pete Larson went to trial. He was acquitted on the charges related to Sue, but was handed a brief sentence for failing to fill out customs forms concerning imported money. In 1997, Sue was turned over to Sotheby's for auction. 
Black Hills tried to buy her back, but was outbid. They couldn't match the record $7.6 million she was sold for. Fair warning then, it's $7,600,000. Up here. Seven million six hundred. Though there's been nothing quite like the battle over Sioux, the hunt for T-Rex has often stirred up controversy and attracted colorful characters. Men like Barnum Brown, who found the very first T-Rex almost a century ago. He would turn up in the dusty badlands sporting an elegant raccoon coat and polished boots. They said he could smell fossils. In 1902, Brown spotted a small bit of bone on a Montana hillside. The rock was so tough, he had to blast it with dynamite. But what he revealed was astonishing, the remains of a gigantic carnivorous dinosaur. At the American Museum of Natural History, where Brown worked, they unpacked the stupendous fossils and dubbed the new find Tyrannosaurus rex, the tyrant lizard king. Eventually, Brown found another specimen, while the museum assembled the first ever skeleton of a Tyrannosaurus. The legend of the killer T-Rex was born. Fossils are still shipped in from the field exactly as they were in Brown's day, encased in a protective coat of burlap and plaster. Beneath that coat, the fossils still lie embedded in fragments of rock. Freeing them is where the hard work of the Black Hills lab begins. It's a painstaking job. Careless preparation could destroy subtle surface details of the bones, such as marks of disease or injury. So the Institute has developed a new technique for eliminating the final layer of rock without damaging the bone. It's like a gentle form of sandblasting, but instead of sand, they use baking soda. The soda particles are softer than the fossil bone and won't damage it. But even with modern techniques, it can take a team of 20 people a year to clean a single large dinosaur. Of the hundreds of bones in a complete tyrannosaur, none are more intriguing than the skull. The team will spend hours poring over every nook and cranny, trying to get inside T-Rex's head and see what really made it the ultimate killing machine. It's 68 million years ago, and T-Rex is on the move. It's picked up the scent of its prey. But is it a mindless marauder or a cunning killer? Though we can't put ourselves inside the mind of T-Rex, we can get inside its fossilized skull. Neil Larson of the Black Hills Institute has studied the brain case and the subtle clues it reveals about T-Rex intelligence. This is the inside of the brain case of a Tyrannosaurus rex. By studying the different nerve endings and looking at the outside of the skull, we can see and figure out how large the brain case of the Tyrannosaurus rex is. This is a cast of a brain from a juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex. An adult T-Rex would have a brain about twice this size. Even though the Tyrannosaurus rex had a large sized brain, it was not as large as a human's. The, brain, the purpose of the brain was to serve for reflexes so it could hunt, so it could fight, so it could uh, sleep and figure out if it was hungry, and for mating. But it did not have the mental capacity that it needed if it was to look at the stars and wonder what was going to happen next. It didn't have to appreciate good music. All it had to do was survive in a world of dinosaurs. While T-Rex was no intellectual, its brain was larger than any of today's reptiles. 
and it was bigger than almost all other dinosaurs, like the plant eaters it tracked down. But just how well that brain could perceive the world around it is a matter of debate. Neil Larson thinks T-Rex had vision that allowed it to home in on its prey. Tyrannosaurus rex had large eyes and binocular vision, eyes that face forward. Unlike plant eaters whose eyes were off to the side, Tyrannosaurus rex eyes looked straight ahead at what it was after, just like that of eagles and like that of the world's greatest predators, humans. It could follow its prey and it also had depth perception so it knew exactly what distance the prey was. Other scientists aren't so sure T-Rex could see in 3D. While its eyes did face forward, its deep snout may have limited the overlap in vision needed for 3D. But one thing no one argues about is the effectiveness of its teeth, 60 of them in an average skull, and longer and stronger than those of any other dinosaur. Well, we've always heard that the teeth of Tyrannosaurus rex were knife-like or dagger-like and strongly serrated. Well, yes, they are serrated, and the serrations are used for cutting through the meat. They're round in cross-section, they're round in shape, so that as the tooth goes through the meat and meets the bone, it can punch right into the bone, thereby crushing it instead of, if it was flat, breaking off. With its large brain and bone-crushing teeth, T-Rex was long thought to be the most fearsome killer that ever lived. But a new discovery may topple T-Rex from his throne. In 1993, in the badlands of Argentina called Patagonia, a chance discovery turned up the remains of a predatory dinosaur that may be even bigger than T-Rex. It was found by car mechanic and fossil hunter Ruben Carolini. He lives near the little frontier town of Plaza Juncal, 700 miles southwest of Buenos Aires. While fossil hunting in his homemade dune buggy one day, he stumbled across a huge bone. At first, he thought it belonged to a giant plant-eating dinosaur and contacted paleontologist Rodolfo Correa at Plaza Juncal's local museum. Correa and a colleague inspected the bone and quickly realized it didn't belong to a plant eater, but to a giant carnivore. They named the great beast Giganotosaurus carolini in honor of its discoverer. This two-foot bone comes from the creature's massive lower jaw. The complete skull is six feet long, the longest of any dinosaur ever found, and a foot longer than T. rexes. In March 1996, less than two-thirds of the creature had been recovered. Parts of the jaw and tail, as well as the front arms and claws, were still buried, leaving many questions unresolved. So Korea and his crew of five set out on the final lap of their momentous search for the biggest meat eater of all. Never passing up a chance to find more of his discovery, Carolini joins the expedition. Once they arrive at the site and set up their tents, the digging can start. Helping the team is visiting American dinosaur hunter, Nate Murphy. On the first day, Korea's luck is in. The crew finds part of the skull called the premaxilla, a bone that holds Giganotosaurus's front teeth and forms its snout. It's an important find. Now Korea can piece together the dinosaur's face. 
It's bigger than I thought. It's kind of a Jimmy Durante of theropods. Right. Big. Right. Big nose. It's the last missing piece from Giganotosaurus's six-foot-long skull and a face they won't forget in a hurry. It definitely wouldn't have won any beauty contests. Would have made T-Rex look like a prom queen. The, the nasal bone is, would be this, in essence, to us. So we've got, we've got this big, ugly nasal uh, processes running right down to the, the opening of the nose. You know, just gnarly, bumpy stuff. And, and then these huge teeth hanging out. Uh, I'll tell you, um, it'd be your worst nightmare. This thing is ugly. After today, Korea unearthed what remained of Giganotosaurus, giving him important new insights into this previously unknown killer. Giganotosaurus was at least three tons heavier and three feet longer than the biggest tyrannosaur. Though at a glance it looks like T-Rex, there are enough differences to suggest they weren't closely related. Giganotosaurus had a smaller, narrower brain. Its razor-sharp teeth were adapted for slashing flesh, not crushing bone. With its thicker bones and massive tail, it may have been a more powerful fighter. But the two would never have battled face to face. Though both come from the Cretaceous period, 144 to 65 million years ago, Giganotosaurus lived in the early part, 30 million years before T-Rex's time. Giganotosaurus has emerged as a truly remarkable beast, a grotesque killer even larger than T-Rex. But perhaps Korea shouldn't be surprised by his creature's uniqueness. Dinosaurs, unlike any others, keep turning up in Argentina. The Argentine Museum of Natural History in Buenos Aires is a treasure house of strange and unique species from ancient Patagonia. For the past 30 years, it has been the home base of Argentina's most celebrated paleontologist, Jose Bonaparte. In 1985, he excavated the remains of a large meat-eating dinosaur. At about 25 feet in length, it was half the size of Giganotosaurus, and not as old. It lived in the Middle Cretaceous period, about 100 million years ago. But as Bonaparte quickly realized, it was more bizarre than other carnivorous dinosaurs. This is the strangest dinosaur we have. It was found 10 years ago in northern Patagonia. The oddity about this dinosaur are these two fern horns along with these very carnivorous teeth. This dinosaur also had a shorter snout than other meat-eating dinosaurs. It reminded Bonaparte of a bull, so he named the creature Carnotaurus, or carnivorous bull lizard. No other meat-eater has horns like Carnotaurus, Bonaparte thinks they weren't hunting weapons, but evolved for sexual display, like the antlers of stags. Perhaps male connoisseurs locked horns when they competed for females. Carnotaurus represents a bizarre offshoot of the meat eater's family tree. But in Argentina, it's not just exotic branches that are found. The possible roots of the family tree have been discovered here, ancestors that would eventually give rise to the most famous killer of all time, T-Rex. Dinosaur hunters have long hoped to find traces of the earliest dinosaur. 
a creature that would be the common ancestor of all the later dinosaur groups, including the giant meat-eating theropods like T-Rex. To hunt for dinosaur origins, they come to Ishiguolasto, the Valley of the Moon. The valley is a gigantic depression in the foothills of the Andes in Argentina. Here the ancient land surfaces are stacked one on top of another, like pages in a book. Fierce winds batter the parched cliff sides and mesa tops, slowly eating away the old land surfaces, exposing each page of the book and the fossils buried millions of years ago. These rocks date from the Triassic period, from 245 to 210 million years ago. This was the age when the first dinosaurs appeared. In the Valley of the Moon, Argentine scientists uncovered fossils of one such early dinosaur, which they named Herrerasaurus. The creature was around 10 feet long and must have weighed about 500 pounds. Though primitive, it possessed many features seen in the major theropod dinosaurs that followed. Paleontologist Bill Sill of San Juan University has been studying Herrerasaurus for 25 years. Herrerasaurus, a primitive carnivorous dinosaur. You have the high narrow skull, big eyes, and notice that all of the strength of the muscles of the jaw were straight over the teeth, which meant that all of the muscle power went directly to the teeth. And on top of that, he had a free forelimb. He was bipedal, so his forelimbs were used for grasping, raking, tearing apart the prey. Look at the size of those claws. Before the time of Herrerasaurus, most large land animals were low-slung creatures that resembled crocodiles. Herrerasaurus looked entirely different. Changes in the structure of its ankles and hips allowed it to walk upright, a bipedal body plan that was to reappear in all later meat-eating dinosaurs. The femur, that's the leg bone. Now look at that, the knee joint and the hip joint allowed him to stand completely vertical, which means he was not only bipedal, but all of his legs were rotated under the body. That means speed and agility. So this fellow would have been like a two-legged tiger going across the plains hunting prey. With Herrerasaurus, the earliest forms of the killer dinosaurs' deadly weapons had appeared. Over millions of years, its descendants evolved their own unique killing strategies. In northwestern Montana, they found the remains of one such descendant. And while they're uncertain of the exact identity, it looks like it could be Velociraptor, a small but chillingly efficient killer. The discovery's been made by an unusual dinosaur hunting team, a family named the Linsters. Each summer, the Linsters pack up their camper and drive out to a ranch for a unique kind of vacation. Who needs the beach when you have your very own dinosaur quarry? Cliff Linster and his family have no formal training in paleontology, but they become skilled at identifying fossils and are meticulous in their field methods. Cliff has taught the boys how to dig fossils like professionals. After the topsoil is removed, they uncover bones with ice picks and brushes while applying acetone hardener to fortify them against breakage. The work is difficult, but there's quite a kick in uncovering dinosaur bones that haven't seen the light of day in 80 million years. And occasionally, like most families, they can't resist a chance to joke around like the time Wesley found the skeleton of a ground squirrel. After carefully painting it black, he told Dad it was a dinosaur bone. One day, our second boy came to me with this 
middle bone here. We looked it over, we couldn't identify it, and from there we went to the Black Hills Institute, and uh, the first guy we showed it to there got a big smile on his face and dug out his book and said, oh, this is a squirrel bone. It is, it's a ground squirrel, common gopher, painted with magic marker, super glued, good job of faking. But practical jokes can backfire. A few days later, Wesley uncovered the real bones of a small dinosaur. We came up to move some overburden, and I got down a little too deep, and I rolled out a dirt clod, and it had the small jaw in there that I could tell was carnivore after I looked at it for a while. So after I found that, I ran down the hill and found my mom. When he first told his mother, she didn't believe him. She thought he was just playing another joke. But soon it was clear that Wesley had found the remains of Velociraptor, or a very close relative. Even more exciting, the bones were tiny. This was a baby dinosaur. It was no more than three feet long and 18 inches tall, about the size of an eagle. Because the bones were so immature, it was hard to be sure of the exact species. The Linsters named it Bambi. When the family showed the bones to paleontologist David Burnham, he instantly recognized the importance of their discovery. Pound for pound, this little guy was, was dynamite. And these bones are so important because the fossil record for small theropods is very rare because the bones are, are lightly built and therefore don't usually preserve very well. Bambi and its parents are part of a group of dinosaurs from the early Cretaceous, commonly called raptors. Lightly built, they probably leaped feet first at prey, using their stiff tails for balance and their retractable toe claw to rip open flesh with a single stroke. Though little is known about their behavior, one site revealed five skeletons buried together, hinting at a frightening idea. These quick and deadly dinosaurs may have run and hunted in packs. With Bambi, we may learn even more about raptors. The Linsters managed to find 90% of the skeleton, making it quite possibly the most complete of its kind ever found. The Linster family's discovery is raising other questions. Appropriately, they concern dinosaur family life. How was delicate young Bambi cared for and protected? Who caught its food? A provocative answer is emerging from a collection of scarred bones found by a Sherlock Holmes of dinosaur sleuthing. This is Como Bluff in Wyoming a fossil gold mine ever since railroad workers found the first bones here in 1877. Today, it's the favorite hunting ground of Bob Bakker and his wife, Constance. Bob is the wild man of dinosaur experts, an original thinker whose provocative theories continue to shake up the field. Now he's reconstructing the family life of carnivorous dinosaurs. The work began when Bob opened a new site just below the ridge at Como Bluff. It turned out to contain a curious mixture of bones from different kinds of large dinosaurs. This is nail quarry, named for an antique nail found on the surface. Most of the time I have to say some amateur student found an important site, but this is one of the few places I can say, I found this. When we started digging in, there were fun things. There were giant carnivorous dinosaurs, meat eaters, some as big as T. rex, but 60 million years earlier. Well, that's kind of interesting. For most of that time, in the Jurassic period, the landscape here was a floodplain without any major rivers or streams. Not the kind of environment where dinosaurs would gather or where their bones would usually survive. Something else must have brought them to Como Bluff. But what? As Bakker dug into the quarry, the mystery deepened. He found the bones of more and more different kinds of dinosaurs, both plant eaters and meat eaters. There are four species of giant carnivorous dinosaurs here. That's interesting. It's a rich fauna of meat eaters. But they were victims. 
as we dug the bones of these giant carnivores, we found they'd been chewed. These weren't eaters, they were eaties. And they were at, they were chewed, they were gnawed. Tooth marks were clearly visible on the bones, so it looked like Nail Quarry had been a feeding site. Dinosaur victims had been killed elsewhere, dragged back, and eaten here. Another weird thing about this quarry is there are no small animals at all. The smallest animal is a baby Diplodocus at five tons, 10,000 pounds. That's the smallest animal. Well, whoever dragged the carcasses here didn't want small, small bodies. They didn't want little prey. They wanted big hunks of meat and bone and gristle. They wanted the haunch of a brontosaur, the shoulders of a stegosaur, the tail of a megalosaur, big pieces. So who was doing the killing, dragging, and eating? Besides the chewing marks, there were other clues scattered among the bones. Meat-eating dinosaurs leave calling cards when they chew. They had teeth like crocodiles or sharks. They'd break off a tooth, a new tooth would grow in. They'd break off their teeth where they were chewing their prey, their carcasses. This is a carnivore tooth. It's got wear at the tip where the enamel was ground off, it was chewing bones. Scattered among the assortment of bones at Nail Quarry, Bakker found teeth that belonged to just one type of dinosaur. And there's only one species of predator, just one, one particular species of allosaur, no one else. So that was an allosaur lair. Weighing almost two tons and stretching over 30 feet, allosaurs were among the Jurassic's most formidable hunters. If Bob is right, they killed their victims first, then dragged them back to Nail Quarry. But why? Among the teeth Bakker found were tiny ones like this, from the smallest allosaur ever found. A baby that probably weighed just one pound, fresh out of the egg. According to Bakker, that's why allosaurs drag their prey here to feed their helpless infants. Here is the shoulder blade of a brontosaur. And cutting across it are tooth marks, left by carnivores who were gnawing away the flesh. Those are pretty deep. That's from a medium-sized allosaur, maybe 1,000 pounds. But here are wee little ones. Those are so small, they only match those tiny baby hatchling allosaurs. So the scene is there's mother and half-grown allosaurs chewing. And over at this corner, the little baby. Before Bakker's discovery, nest sites of only plant-eating dinosaurs had been found, together with evidence of parental care. But many paleontologists assumed that carnivorous dinosaurs were solitary killers who didn't look after their young. Now, bones from Nail Quarry are changing that view. Even the fiercest dinosaurs, it seems, became caring parents when they got back home. If you're a baby lion, you're not fed rabbits. You're not fed chipmunks. You're fed hunks of zebra. Your baby lion, mother brings you a piece of zebra, big piece. Well, if you were a baby allosaur right here in this part of Wyoming, you wouldn't be fed a little chipmunk-sized dinosaur, and you didn't have to hunt for yourself. You just had to wait for mom, maybe your aunt, maybe dad, to drag in the latest two-ton hunk of meat, and then you could sit right here and gnaw to your little baby allosaur's heart's content. In his reconstruction of the allosaur feeding site, Bakker's passion for understanding how dinosaurs behaved is evident. All paleontologists ultimately strive in their own way for a similar goal, to reconstruct the lost world of dinosaur behavior. With five T-Rexes under their belt, right. the team at Black Hills Institute are in a unique position to test ideas about how carnivorous dinosaurs lived and died. This is Stan, a T-Rex discovered in South Dakota in 1992, the second most complete skeleton ever found. Stan is a world traveler, newly returned from a tour of Japan. While he's on the road, Stan looks more like a giant erector set than a dinosaur.
That's because he's designed to be taken apart and fit into a collection of wooden crates, then slotted back together when he reaches his destination. Each bone is the original fossil. Black Hills has used all of its knowledge of T-Rexes to restore and mount Stan. Anatomically, he's probably the most up-to-date version of a T-Rex in the world today. Early reconstructions depicted tyrannosaurs as portly creatures, barely able to support their own weight and dragging their tails on the ground. But assembling recent specimens like Stan has revealed how wrong those early views were. The mistakes go back to the days of Barnum Brown, who found the first T-Rexes in Montana almost a century ago. When he brought them back to the American Museum in New York, no one knew for sure how the bone should be mounted. The director, Henry Fairfield Osborne, did the best he could with the little information then available. After considering several alternatives, he finally posed the first tyrannosaur upright with its tail and feet planted on the ground. This is the T-Rex that stood in the American Museum until 1990, scaring generations of children and inspiring Hollywood producers. The land unknown. Could man have survived in the dinosaur age of mighty monsters? Shudder at history's most ferocious killer, Tyrannosaurus Rex. But according to Black Hills Institute's Neil Larson, the museum got it all wrong. Eighty years ago, when scientists mounted the first Tyrannosaurus Rex, they mounted it like, they, like this toy, and like they did all toys ever since then. They mounted it standing on two legs, resting on its tail for a balance. They couldn't figure out how T-Rex, being a bipedal animal, could stand on the two legs without falling flat on his face. But the more complete Tyrannosaurus skeletons unearthed in the 1990s are helping dinosaur experts rethink T-Rex anatomy. It seems they had no problem balancing on their back legs and didn't drag their tails. A V-shaped bone straddled the vertebra and limited the tail's up and down motion. Locked high off the ground, it counterbalanced the creature's massive head. And with that counterbalance, he did not fall flat on his face. He could stand, he could walk, he could run at breakneck speed, chasing down his prey with that tail stretched out right behind him. And so was born a new T-Rex, the sprinting killer with a top speed of 40 miles per hour, according to Larson. But could this be just another T-Rex myth? Could T-Rex really sprint up to 40 miles per hour, as its revised posture suggests? To find out, you might come to Montana and look up Matt Smith, a renowned dinosaur sculptor. Smith became curious about T-Rex's mobility when the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman asked him to design and build a new T-Rex. In 1990, the museum had unearthed the most complete skeleton known at that time and wanted to show visitors what it would have looked like in the flesh. In sculpting this rendition of the T-Rex, I was very fortunate. We were able to lay out all the bones, take a look at the relationship between the ribs, the vertebrae, everything. To ensure his model was accurate, Smith had to measure each part of the creature, every bone, tooth, and claw. Then he had to decide how much flesh to put on the bones. It wasn't just guesswork. Although the Tyrannosaurus muscles are long gone, each has left its mark on the bones. The larger the muscle, the bigger the scar. You need to look at the bones. And on the surface of the fossil, 
there's a correlation between the force the muscle exerts onto the surface of the bone and the scarring it leaves behind. By looking at that, you can help identify the placement of the muscle, the size, and it'll help give you uh, a more accurate rendition of the animal. With the model fleshed out and complete, Smith sent out copies for other dinosaur researchers to study. One reached paleontologist Jim Farlow of Indiana Purdue University, who wanted to use the model to investigate T. rex's top running speed. According to Farlow, the creature's speed would be limited by its weight, so he used the model in a water displacement experiment to estimate how much the T. rex weighed when it was alive. His calculations showed that it would have weighed six to eight tons. If a T-Rex that heavy ran faster than around 20 miles per hour, Farlow believes the consequences would be fatal. You've got an animal, a really big, heavy animal, the size of a small truck, going at this kind of speed in these certain scenarios, it can't stop itself. What if T-Rex stumbled or tripped while sprinting at high speed? The head alone coming down from 15 feet in the air, that would be like taking a really big watermelon and dropping it from a second or third story window. I mean, the impact, the deceleration would sort of make it blow up like a water balloon. Next, its body would be crushed under its own weight as it crashed to the ground. Internal bleeding, <laughs> broken bones, punctured lungs, you know, I just don't think it likely that the animal would have engaged in that kind of activity even if the leg bones had been capable of supporting it. The risk strikes me as just too great. Not everyone accepts Farlow's view, but a T-Rex running at even 20 miles an hour would be terrifying enough. Though tripping may have been disastrous for T-Rex, it wasn't the only danger large carnivorous dinosaurs faced. As scientists scrutinize the bones of meat eaters, the truly violent nature of their world is appearing. At the Black Hills Institute, dinosaur hunter Terry Wentz examined Sue before she was locked away by the FBI. He recalls injuries he found in her bones. Well, Tyrannosaurus rex had a very violent, uh, hard life. I mean, they fought a lot and we can tell that because of the things we found with like Sue for instance the Tyrannosaurus rex from Faith area. When I was working on the rib there's one of the ribs had a big mass of extra bone growth on it. Ver real weird looking. It didn't look like a rib at all. It had just a big mass of bone on it, extra bone from an injury. Down way down inside of that injury was a piece of Tyrannosaurus rex tooth. That rib had been bitten into by another T-Rex. And she also had another very interesting injury that astounds scientists when they see it. That is, she had a broken leg. And Sue survived that injury. It actually healed. With a broken leg, Sue could not have hunted for food. Perhaps a mate fed her while she convalesced. Could a fearsome T-Rex also be a kind partner? Maybe, but in the end, it was another tyrannosaur that caused Sue's death. The last injury that Sue um, had didn't heal. She was literally bitten in the back of the head by another T-Rex, and it killed her. He bit in the back, crushed her skull on top, and just ripped out the lower jaw. It was just ripped right out, and you can kind of tell it looked like the flesh on the front of the jaw actually held it in place, but the whole back of the jaw was just ripped right out. Some meat eaters mutilated each other, perhaps while defending their turf. Others were wounded in pursuit of prey. Bob Bakker has found evidence that the mightiest hunters of the Jurassic period, the Allosaurs, faced menacing adversaries. This particular Allosaur has a wound inflicted in a battle with a plant eater. It's right here. There's a deep, penetrating wound, which went all the way through the bone and produced an open, oozing abscess that lasted for months. Every time this critter sat down, it probably went, whoo! Who made the wound? 
probably the rear end of a stegosaurus where there are massive spikes. The crime probably went like this. Here's an allosaur. Here's a stegosaur with spikes and whack. As the slow work of freeing their secrets from the rock continues, the true lives of the meat-eating dinosaurs are coming to light. While there's no doubt they were horrifying monsters, scientists are discovering that they were like nearly all creatures that have inhabited Earth. They struggled in their own unique ways to survive, to feed themselves, to care for their young, and to protect their kind. As more new discoveries are made and more bones interpreted, the killer dinosaurs are becoming more fascinating than ever.